Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. <clears throat> Today we are studying the Prophet Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, chapter 12. This is Saul Weinreb, the host for your podcast. We just read in chapter 11 about the two-way covenant between God and his people. But the people, unfortunately, weren't keeping their side of the bargain. We learned from the Prophet that what God wants is not ritual and prayer, but what he wants is actual improvement. What he wants is the people's hearts. And then we ended chapter 11 with the frightening and disturbing revelation that the people were conspiring to kill Yirmiyahu, to murder the prophet, because they would rather get rid of the messenger then heed his difficult message. And with this, we then start chapter 12 with the the prophet Yirmiyahu speaking to God. Now, imagining that Yirmiyahu has just heard how, how poorly received, to put it mildly, his, his words were, um, by the people so much so that they were, that they were literally out to kill him. So the reaction, there's a lot of reactions that that someone can have to such a situation. One can be turned to God and be fed up. Why are you sending me on this mission, mission which is futile and dangerous and you're putting my life in danger? You could um, certainly anger at God would be an understandable reaction. So your Mio does begin with anger at God, but not in exactly the way um, that you might imagine. He begins by stating that, yes, God, I'm angry with you. I have an argument with you. Um, But I know that no matter what my claims are, you are correct and will have an answer. Um, I might not know those answers. I might not understand those answers. I may not even like those answers. But I know that you have the answers. But I'm going to make these claims anyway. So let's hear how the prophet addresses God. Verse 1 in chapter 12. Tzadik ato Adonai. God, you are righteous. You are the tzadik. You are the one who is correct. If we have an argument, you're the one who will have the winning argument. Ki ariv elecha. If I shall, or when I shall, argue with you. I, I think when is a better translation here because he's about to do that. However, nonetheless, even though I acknowledge that you're going to beat me in this argument, here goes. Ah, however, mishpatim adaber osach. I am going to speak to you about justice. And what your Mio is saying is that I don't see justice. What I see is not just. So I'm going to argue, I'm going to challenge you, God, anyway. Madua derech rishoim tzolecha. Why is the way of the wicked people successful? Why is it that they are walking around and everything is fine, but I, who am trying to place to teach them the correct path to God, I am threatened with murder. Shalu kol bogde boged. All of those people who are rebellious against you, they are at peace. They're doing fine. This question, of course, is a very common question, one that that all of us have asked at some point in our lives. I do want to mentioned that, of course, this is not um, new to uh, the prophets. We found many of the prophets um, challenging God in this way, and I'm going to mention a few shortly. Um, But first, I just want to read another one or two verses so we fully see um, the, the arguments that that the prophet has with God. So let's go on to verse 2. Nitatam, not only do you allow them to prosper and allow them to be successful, but you planted them, Gam Sho Rashu, and they have taken root. You have enabled them, you've given them the resources. Where do they get these resources from? To be able to implant themselves and grow roots that grow within the society, within that they have established, these evil people, Yelchu Gamasu Peri. Not only did you allow them to lay roots down, 
but you allow them to grow and prosper and make fruits and make more evil people. Karova tabefiem, you know very well that yes, you are spoken in their mouths. They're walking around saying, God willing this and God willing that. But virachok mikilyoseem, you are very far away from their inside, from who they truly are, because they truly are treacherous and dishonest and immoral people. And you allowed this. You gave them the wherewithal. You gave them the, the, the environment. You gave them the wealth which they needed in order to take root and spread and even bear fruit. And yet you, God, you have known me. Tir'eni, you have seen me. You've watched me. You've watched me trying to fulfill the mission that you sent me on. You know who I am. You have tested my heart with that and have found that my heart is with you. You searched me out. You see that I have been faithful. I have carried out this mission, even though this is such a hopeless and now dangerous mission. Get rid of these evil people and drive them out of the pen like you drive out sheep on their way to slaughter. Get them ready to kill them, to get rid of the evil. Now, this is sounds very aggressive, obviously, that Jeremiah is actually asking God to kill the enemy. Immediately, Jeremiah, in the next verse, verse 4, um, kind of uh, draws back a little bit from the brink of anger. And then he says, Admosai tavel aretz. I don't really want destruction. I don't want all these people to die and get destroyed. Even though I just said that out of anger, Jeremiah, the prophet is saying to God, what I really want is that this destruction should never happen. Admasai, until when will we have to see the land mourning? Why do I have to see these visions of destruction? Why do I have to see the land in mourning and people dying because of evil? The Asev Kalasadi Yivash and seeing all of the grass of the fields dried out. And why are they dried out? Because of the evil of the people that reside within the land. And we know that when the people are corrupt, everything loses. Every, the entire, the fields, the forests, even the animals and the birds suffer because the people allow this destruction to happen. And why is it that all of this destruction is happening? Because the people don't get it. They think that God doesn't look and God doesn't care about what happens to us. Because they, 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 they have bought the ideology of the idols, that gods don't care about what people do, gods don't care about where people are going, all gods care about is whatever you give them to appease them, the sacrifices, the, the rituals, or whatever they may be. They decide, Lo yiret they think God doesn't care about us, why, God's a God. Why should He care about us? The essence of Judaism is that God cares about us. He wants us to be successful. He wants us to do good. That's why we're here. But because the people keep saying, Lo God doesn't care, doesn't watch, He doesn't think, He doesn't look. That's why the situation has deteriorated to the point where I have to see destruction. And here Jeremiah, well, at first he slipped and said, I want to destroy them, kill them. And then he says, no, why should I see destruction? I don't want to see destruction. I want people to get the message. And he continues, Ki et raglim vayal ucha. If you are going to run in a race against people that run by foot, so you're going to run in a marathon, and now you're exhausted, from racing other people, and you're exhausted and you can't and tired. Now you think is it time? Now that you're exhausted by running against people, can you now go and run against a race and compete with horse with horses? Of course not. That's ridiculous, right? This this metaphor the prophet is trying to say. How is it 
if the people, when they had everything that they needed, when things were easy, when they had a nation, when they had a country, when they had a king, when they had land, when they had produce, when they had animals, when they had all of those things, they weren't successful and properly living the, the type of life that God wanted them to live. How is it possible when they're up against something so much worse, the long, long exile, that long suffering, the suffering that the people were about to embark upon for thousands of years of suffering and torture. If you couldn't make it through the good times, how do you plan on making it through the bad times? If you're only secure when you're in a land where there's peace, how are you going to do when you're stuck in the in the um, wild areas across the Jordan River beyond the places when you're not secured within your borders when you're thrown to other wild areas how are you going to make it through those times Yemiyahu is looking at the future and he's wondering these people when they're here when they have everything they're no good when they have everything they're immoral when they have everything they're constantly fighting with each other and and therefore God is about to take that away from them and send them into exile. What's going to be when they're in exile? How are they going to make it through that? Tigam achecha vesavicha. The only way this is, I'm about I'm reading verse six now. The only way they can make it through is with unity, is with honesty, is with togetherness, is by working together. But now, when everything is fine, even their own brothers, even the members of their father's family, gamhema bagduvach, they themselves have already rebelled against each other. They can't even get along with each other now when things are good. They still call after you, God, and rebel together, all as one. And you can't trust each other. You can't trust them. Even when they go ahead and they speak nicely to each other and they speak nicely to you, one to another. And it also means when they speak nicely to God and pretend that they're pious. What's going to happen? If you can't even get along now, how are you guys going to develop unity so that you can make it through the long exile that is to come when God throws you away from the land? Let's look at verse 7. Azafti et beiti. This is now God speaking. Now we shift from, from the prophet speaking to God speaking. And God is, is to some extent, he, he's actually responding to Yermio and he's saying, Yes, I, you're complaining to me that 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 um, that the evil are prospering. You're complaining to me. How is it? Why is it that all this destruction is going to happen? You're complaining to me and saying, how is it that the people are going to make it through? Do you think this is what I want? God said, I didn't want it this way. Azafti et Besi, In order to punish them, what did I have to do? I had to abandon my temple, my home. Notashti et nachlati. I have deserted. I have, I have, I've given away my inheritance, the Nachlati, the people of Israel that were the inheritance of God, so to speak. I had to give them up to the, to, to the, to the, to the other nations. Notati et yididut nafshi. I have given the ones who are beloved to my soul, but I have given them over to the hands of her enemies. Do you think this is what I wanted to do? This is not what I intended when I brought them out of Egypt. I gave them the Torah. I gave them their land. I didn't intend on doing this because I wanted to give them away. My inheritance was like a lion in the forest. She has raised her voice against me. She has um, roared her voice. This is why I've hated her. I've hated her because she rebelled against me like a lion in the forest. I like to... Uh, I, this this metaphor of a lion in the forest is is really the idea that a lion by nature is a predator. A lion might sometimes sit and look uh, like a beautiful, nice uh, animal, but by nature it is going to, when it's hungry, it is going to eat its prey. God is saying that my people acted like a lion, even when they might look like they're okay. I, I don't, there was a recently a, a, a viral video of, of a leopard that was treating nicely a, a baby a baboon. The leopard had killed the mother baboon and then the leopard found that the, it had orphaned a little baby baboon and it was being nice to this baby. So it looked really nice, but, but it's hard to imagine. 
I mean, I don't know what the end of the story there was, but it's hard to imagine that when push comes to shove, when the leopard gets hungry, it'll eat the baby baboon too. And I see that here as kind of a metaphor because that's the nature of the aryeh vayar, of the predator in the forest. That's God is saying that the people have acted this way, that no matter what I do, they, they don't, they treat me wrongly. No matter what I do, they ignore me, God, and they go on their own way and they do their own thing, almost like it's their nature, like it would be the nature of a, of a, of a, of a lion, of a predator. Ha'ayet, the tzavua nachalati li, the my nachala, my inheritance, my people, the people that I love, they are acting like a bird of prey. Uh, Ayat Savua is a is a, some kind of bird of prey, whether it's an eagle or a hawk or a vulture, some sort of bird of prey that's colorful, that is uh, well known in in the Middle East as just a very um, aggressive and and a very um, uh, uh, violent bird of prey. Ayat Savua, the let. So if that's how she's acting towards me, God says. So therefore, the ayat should then. Go, the, those birds of prey, the other nations, should surround her and treat her that way and destroy the nation. Lechu, go ahead. Ithvu kol chayat hasadeh heisrayu l'achla. Go ahead, gather, gather all the beasts of the field. The people, they act like lions. They act like, like birds of prey. They treat me that way, God says. They treat each other that way. They can't trust each other. If that's the way they are, then go ahead, let all the animals of the field, and this is just a metaphor for all of the nations of the world, let them all gather around and come attack my people and let them go ahead and destroy them. This ayat, as we know it, from the Brit uh, Bein uh, Habitarim, from the the uh, the special covenant when God, that God made with Abraham when he asked him to split the animals and walk between the animals, and remember the ayat, the, it was the same bird that came to eat those animals at the end. Um, so there the ayat was a sign of the, dis, of the people um, destroying the enemies, the ones who, who, who um, came at them over here. That same, uh, that same animal, that same metaphor is being used, in, but in the opposite way, that the ayat is... The people themselves are acting like a, 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 a an aggressive bird of prey, and therefore they will be devoured by others in that way. Roim rabim, many leaders, many shepherds, shichatu karmi, they destroyed my vineyard. Over here, I would uh, refer back to the the way God has been referring to the people um, here, and and as as I had something beautiful, and then they rebelled, reminds us significantly. Of what we have in in in, in Isaiah, Isaiah five, um, where God compared the Jewish people to um, uh, to to a vineyard. If you remember, it said God said, "I am going to sing a song for my beloved." It uses the same language here, there, li di di, as God used that same language, ye did, my beloved people. Shirat do di le carmo, the song of a lover for his vineyard. Kerem hayel didi, I had a vineyard, Bikaren men shaman, God said over there. Now God is saying the same thing. Ro'im rabim shichatu karmi, but in the, in the words of, uh, um, in a prophecy to Jeremiah, it's similar to what he said to Isaiah back then. Shichatu karmi, they have destroyed my vineyard. Bosesu et chelkati, they have crushed it and, and stomped all over my portion. This is what these these leaders, the shepherds, refer again, and we've had this term several times in Jeremiah so far. The Uroim are the false leaders, the leaders that led the people in the wrong direction, the false prophets who kept telling the people that not to worry, everything's fine, you don't have to be better, you don't have to change. Those leaders, they made my beloved portion my beloved nation, they turned them into a desolate wilderness. Somalish mama. They have been the ones that made it a, a, a desolate. Avla alai shemehima. They have made me mourn, God says. God is mourning. Uh, they have made this desolation which causes me to mourn my people. Remember, this is God's response to Jeremiah. 
you're asking me why I'm doing this destruction. Well, I don't want to do this destruction. I'm doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because these leaders ruined it. I'm doing it because the people ruined it. This is why the entire land is being destroyed. The most tragic thing is because people don't even care. It is this lack of concern. The evil is bad enough, but worse than the evil is that nobody even cares to fix it. It reminds me of um, of the... Uh, Famous quote from Martin Luther King, uh, I'll quote, The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. It's when, yes, people are bad, which is bad, but even worse than that is that no one even seems to care. No one stands up and says something. And we continue with verse 11. I'll call Shafaya Midbar on all of those high places, Midbar on all of those high places in the desert, Ba'u Shodidim. The people have come to destroy. The marauders have come to destroy. Because the sword, which belongs to God, is destroying these these high places. High places this is usually a reference to the arrogant ones. From one end of the earth to the other end. There is no peace for any flesh. Not humans, not animals. Nothing has peace when the people are corrupt. Uh, verse verse 13 the people planted wheat and they ended up harvesting thorns this should remind us of Psalms 126 verse 5 where it talks about their days of redemption the good days and it says those that plant with tears they're planting their last seeds when it comes time to harvest they will harvest with joy, with a bountiful harvest. Well, here Jeremiah, when he's talking about the destruction, flips it to the opposite. They plant and plant, but what do they get? They just get thorns. Nechlu lo yo ilu. They've been given pain. They've been made to suffer, but it hasn't helped. God is complaining again. We've had this many times in the prophets to complain that I did punish them. I, I exiled the northern tribes. And they still didn't get the message. Therefore, they are going to be embarrassed and ashamed by, by what they harvest. By, because, because the fruits of their labor will be nothing. They've had labor. They've had punishment. They've had warnings. But the fruits of that, which should have been repentance and improvement and eventually gaining back the bounty that they used to have and the great relationship that they should have with God instead the result was that they ignored it and everything got even worse because of the terrible anger of God continue to verse 14 here um, I would like to um, uh, point your attention to Isaiah chapter 10 where he discusses the Assyrians and he says, God allowed the Assyrians to come and attack and plunder in the land. However, the Assyrians then took it way farther than they should and they destroyed and they pillaged and raped and so on to the extent way beyond what God would have allowed them to do. And God is saying now to all those peoples, yes, I did just say that I'm going to allow all of the nations to come and attack Israel and punish them. But that doesn't mean that there won't be a reckoning for you. That doesn't mean that there won't be a reckoning for those nations whom are, are guilty of, of destroying Israel and guilty of, of destroying it in an utter destruction which I didn't call for. So it, it flips now. We just talked about the terrible destruction that is going to come at the hands of these nations, but then says, but I want you to know, you nations are, you're going to have to still pay for what you do when you make my people suffer. So, This, so says God, to all of my neighbors, the evil ones, the ones who come and and attack and destroy my inheritance, God says, Asher hinchalti et et Israel, that inheritance which I gave to my nation Israel, I gave them this land, and if you're coming, yes, it's true, 
that I am allowing them to be uprooted from their land. Via the Beit Yehuda and the house of Yehuda, I am etosh mitocham. I am going to remove them from there. However, v'haya achareinat shi otam. It will be. This is verse fourteen. It will be after I remove them. Ashuv richamtim. I will come back and have mercy upon them. Because this destruction that you are, uh, are putting against the people of Israel is much, much more, much, much worse than what I really allowed and wanted you to do. That you chose to do, not me, says God. So I am going to bring them back to their land. I am going to bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. And I want you to know that. And those of you that caused them to suffer more suffering than they were due will have to pay for that. However... I want you to know too, God says, that you have a chance. That this, just because you are not part of the Jewish people now, doesn't mean that you won't be part of the ultimate redemption in the future. You have a choice. All the nations of the world have a choice. As he says in verse 15, If during that exile you learned the ways of my nation, the proper ways of my nation, you learn how to swear properly in my name, by the by the, by God. And if you learn the proper ways for my nation, and you learn to be loyal to me, says God, to all the other nations, just like before, you taught my nation your bad ways, to go and worship uh, idols. If you, if just like you taught them the bad ways, they learned those bad ways and got su- and had to suffer for it. If you now learn the good ways from them, and you learn to be loyal to me, then Then when you are redeemed, when my people are redeemed, I'm sorry, you will be together with them. You will be built within my people. This is clearly a demonstration that the purpose of the future is that all nations will be one and the same under God. No, once If once those other nations learn the lessons that the Jewish people have to teach them, if they do learn the lessons, and of course if the people, the Jewish people do teach them, then v'nivnu betochami, all of you will be together within my nation. There will be one big nation worshiping God in the future. However, it will be your choice. If you do not listen, if you do not listen, then, in other words, despite my people trying to teach you the right way, then that nation, in the ultimate future, they will be destroyed and gone and no memory left, and that will be the end of them. This is a tremendous statement for what the, the prophetic vision of the future is, the purpose of the of the Jewish exile is for the Jews to teach this message to all the nations of the world so that nivnu betochami those are the words of Yimio so that all of those nations will be built in to my nation Israel we will all be together under God this is the same message which we have seen in in many of the other prophets especially in the words of Isaiah and these are now the words of the prophet Jeremiah chapter 12 thank you so much for studying chapter 12 looking forward to studying more of the book of Jeremiah together with you